the third annual meeting of the South and West Pacific uh, for the CB2030 project. Um, it's good to see there's lots of people on and it's really great to see the, uh, the wide response from around the Pacific region. Um, I'll just do some housekeeping to start with. Um, first of all, uh, just to let everybody know that this meeting is going to be recorded and the recordings will be made available through the centre web page um, at the end of this three day meeting. Uh, today, or uh, well, the next three days, the schedules will last two and a half hours. Um, so, we, and we've got a coffee or tea break scheduled uh, in between each day. Um, some basic housekeeping um, for each speaker. If you're speaking, you've got 15 minutes to talk to, which includes answers. So if you can keep to that time, so we stay on schedule, uh, that'd be fantastic. Um, for everyone who's listening, if you want to ask questions or make comments, uh, please use the raised hand option on Teams or um, put something into the chat uh, and, and uh, we can get those questions answered. Um, and I do encourage everybody, please feel free to ask questions and have a discussion because that's what this meeting is about. It's not really a formal listen. I really want uh, engagement from all you all who are listening and please engage with our speakers. If, if, if the opportunity is such that, that we can't answer your questions, we will get those questions answered by email um, afterwards. Um, can we, uh, we can control the, the meeting from here, but just please make sure everybody got your cameras off uh, and your microphones off uh, when people are presenting. And um, having said that, uh, I'd like to formally welcome everybody to this meeting. Um, we're going to start off right now with a, an address from a New Zealand government minister, Minister Damien O'Connor. He is the Minister for Land Information, um, which I know it's ironic, but in New Zealand, the, the maritime estate and hydrography is managed by the Ministry of Land Information. Um, so we're going to start with an opening address from Minister O'Connor. And hopefully this works. Kia ora koutou, uh, to wherever in the world you are today. As Minister for Land Information in New Zealand, I'm pleased to be able to talk to you at your third community meeting. This morning, the Chief Executive of Taitu Te Whenua Land Information New Zealand signed a memorandum of agreement with the Nippon Foundation Gebco Seabed 2030 project. It's great to see the Seabed 2030 project is one of the first actions officially endorsed as part of the UN Ocean Decade. We're the first government to sign up to this significant global mapping project, and we have done this on behalf of the South and West Pacific Ocean Regional Centre. We have the confidence to take on the significant project because of your support. Our government last year created a new portfolio and cabinet for oceans and fisheries. The Minister of Oceans and Fisheries and I work closely together on this important area. As a government, we recently approved a vision for the portfolio of ensuring the long-term health and resilience of ocean and coastal ecosystems, including the role of fisheries. This portfolio is an opportunity to recognise the value of our oceans and carefully use and protect them in a way that doesn't take away from future generations. The new portfolio has six principles. Two of these principles may be of interest to you and the mapping work you are all supporting. First is to make decisions based on sound science and traditional knowledge. The second is to manage marine resources consistent with international commitments. I look forward to hearing from my officials of the plan you collectively put in place over the next two days of your meeting. In Māori, we have a saying that is he waka ekanoa, which means a canoe we are all in with no exception. We are all in this together. On behalf of the Government of New Zealand and our teams at Land Information New Zealand, NIWA and GNS Science, Thank you again for all coming together and for your international support of this very important work.
Right. Um, that was very nice words from Minister O'Connor. Um, and, and we appreciate his time to make that uh, speech. Um, we were hoping to have him in person, but uh, for those of you who aren't in New Zealand, we've just experienced some pretty catastrophic floods in his electorate. So right now he's got more important things to do worrying about his voters uh, and, the, and the disaster that's unfolded onto them. But anyway, we do appreciate um, his time and effort to make that video. Um, and I just want to also correct the minister. He did say two days. This, this meeting is actually over three days, so it will finish on Friday. So um, right now I'd like to pass, uh, move on to the agenda uh, and like to uh, get the director of CB2030, uh, Mr. Um, Jamie Michael McPhillips, to uh, talk about and briefly run about the project as a whole uh, and introduce it to those who don't know about this project. So thank you, Jamie. Tena Kotu. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Did you hear that? I, I can hear you. <laughs> right. Hello. Hello again, everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, Okay, well, well th thank you for the introduction, Kevin. And, and just following on from, from the minister's words, this is mapping the ocean is hugely important work. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here at, I think this is now my second Southwest Pacific Regional Mapping Community meeting in, in, during my tenure and uh, uh, um, amazing attendance from across the region. So, so thank you for inviting me again. Uh, I'm going to just give you a quick update on where we are with Seabed 2030. Um, some of you will have seen some of these slides before, but I know that some individuals will be new, so please bear with me as I, as I run through some of the slides. So what is Seabed 2030? Well, for those of you that are familiar with it, you already know, but it is a collaboration between the Nippon Foundation of Japan and JEBCO, as it says there, to inspire the mapping of our oceans and to deliver a complete map of the world ocean floor by the year 2030, and to make that freely available in the form of the JEBCO grid, free to use, free to download. And for those of you that are not aware of it, then please ask your regional center, and we can point you in the right direction as to how you can download it and how you can use it. A little bit of history there. The project was born or, the, or conceived in 2016 in the, at the Forum for the Future Ocean Floor Mapping as a collaboration between Seabed 20, between JEBCO, I should say, and, and the Nippon Foundation. The project was launched in 2017 at the Ocean Conference by Chairman Sasakawa of the Nippon Foundation, and that was year one of the project. We're coming towards the end, at the end of this month, the end of year four, soon to move into year five. I'm delighted to announce that this year, on the 8th of June, we, we were alerted to the fact that we have been endorsed as a decade program. So one of those first calls to action or early actions of the decade. So, so that's a huge accolade and, and a huge opportunity to leverage all the other activities within the decade that, that, that complement us and, and where we complement complement them. So again, for those of you that are familiar with JEBCO, you'll be fully aware of this, but, but just to, for absolute clarity, JEBCO is an acronym for the General Bathymetric Chart of the Oceans. And JEBCO is a joint, and I should have corrected the slide here, it's now a joint program that is that operates under the auspices of the IHO and the IOC, the International Hydrographic Organization and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, and has been de doing so since 1903, with the aim, as it says on the slide, to provide the most authoritative publicly available bathymetric data sets of the world's oceans to whomever wants to use them. It's a voluntary community, and that community is 
consists of scientists, engineers, data specialists, hydrographers, all collaborating with that to achieve that aim. Seabed 2030, in a little bit more detail, we have a network of centres, four regional centres split across five sites, uh, who are engaged in networking across their regions and bringing together and assembling data into regional comp compilations, which then head off to the global centre where they're all stitched together and published as a Jebco grid. Clearly not as simple as that, a lot more detail, lot, lots more work goes behind the scenes, but you get a flavour of what they do. Some of you may have seen this equation before, the, 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 the data equation, you might have seen it as X, Y, Z, we've changed it to A, B, C, uh, to avoid it being, being confused with, with a, a geospatial reference frame. Uh, but essentially, A is the data that exists in Jebco. B is the data that has already been gathered but hasn't quite made it to, to the Jebco grid yet. And C is the component of the equation for that part of the ocean that has yet to be mapped. And again, on the slide, a few initiatives there. I won't go into them in any great detail at the moment. You'll hear more about these undoubtedly later. Progress so far? Well, when Seabed 2030 stood up back in 2017, there was 6% coverage in the Jebco grid, Jebco 2014. That doesn't mean to say that there wasn't more data around, but, but all that had been assembled in the grid was 6% and a lot more sitting on people's shelves in servers yet, yet to be incorporated. So that was part of the early stages of the project whilst also dealing with newly gathered data. And today, as of the 2021 release, we now stand at 25 point, 20, sorry, 20.5% of the world ocean mapped. And the slide here, the blue is Jebco 2014. The orange are the data additions that have, have taken place up to and including 2021. So we published in June 2021, 20.6%. I may have said 25.5 in the previous slide, but it is 20.6. But that means we've still got four fifths of the world's ocean floor still to be mapped. And the slide here shows you the extent of the blackness of the ocean. That's parts of the ocean where we have not got any data. So that's where we need to combine our efforts regionally and internationally to start filling in those gaps. And for those of you that are interested, there is you can look at the Jebco grid in more detail at jebco.net where you can download it. But also I put up some, some links to a couple of very new beta version interact, interactive web apps that you can have a look at and have a play with. Um, and they'll be on the presentation that will go up and made available to everybody. The, the challenge, as always, is existing technologies. Um, we're showing a ship here, but that could equally be uh, an autonomous vessel. We're seeing much more of that now. That has been a huge game changer in recent years. Uh, but we are still still limited by the physics of the ocean and the propagation of, of sound through the ocean space for all the deep water hydrography and bathymetry that we need to undertake. I'll throw this slide up here. And again, for those of you who want to look in this in more detail, it will be there as part of the presentation material. I'd, I'm hoping it will be familiar for those that are, are used to operating or working with multi-beam data. But the key thing is up in the right-hand part of the slide are the target resolutions. And these, these are published in, in our CBET 2030 policy material, but essentially we are looking for target resolutions in the depth bands as described there. So the highest resolution we're looking for is a 100 meter, one depth sounding in a 100 meter grid square down to one depth sounding in 800 by 800 meter grid square in deeper water. What does that mean? Well, a little graphic here showing, showing the, the, the varying resolutions of grid square depending on depth. And essentially, 
if we have one depth value in a cell, we consider it to be mapped. Um, lots of other ways of doing this, but that, that's how we've determined we will get to our 2030 mission. The point here is that if you have data that you can share with us, let's not be too hidebound by the resolutions that I showed in the previous slide. Let us have your data regardless of the resolution that, that it's been gathered at, because some data is better than no data. And similarly, and again, you'll hear more about this throughout the course of, of these next few days, sharing data in an ideal world, we'd like it to be made publicly available and shared via the IHO's Data Center for Digital Bathymetry. But equally, if you've got data that's protected in some way, but you can free it up, you can decimate it in a way that it can be used in the Jebco grid, then please consider that. If, if you can't share it publicly, please at least consider sharing it with CBA 2030 and Jebco. So making it all happen is, is a truly community effort. It's, it's science, it's scientists, it's industry, it's government, and of course, it's citizen science because we shouldn't forget the power of crowdsource bathymetry. If you're a pleasure boat user, uh, a yacht master, then a relatively inexpensive data logger and you can gather some valuable, albeit sparse, but valuable data that will help populate that those dark parts of the Jebco grid. I hope this slide makes sense, but bathymetry is a golden thread through all those decade challenges. It's the base layer of any 3D map upon which other science may wish to build. And then a whole host of, of, of other aspects where bathymetry is hugely important for science, for modeling, for ocean stewardship. And I won't go into that in great detail at the moment because I know most people here have, have an interest in particular aspects of science and are fully familiar with that. So a few a few requests here, please help us by promoting the vital need to, to, to map the entire seabed, encourage your own organizations and your networks to make existing data available. If it's commercially sensitive, let's have a discussion as, as to how we might better use it. Um, there's a link up there for contributions, for public available contributions, please consider that. Help us gather crowdsource bathymetry. Support us in any future mapping projects where data can be used by Seabed 2030. If you're engaged in planning a science mission, consider how you might better gather bathymetry. If you're short of sonar operators, but you've got a sonar system that, that would otherwise be redundant, get in touch and let's work out how together we might better use it. And let's look at how innovation might help us accelerate ocean mapping. We're not necessarily experts in, in, in global innovation. There are, there are many others out there that are studying this in detail, that are innovating on a daily basis. Let's work together to look at how innovation can help. Um, last few days, most of you will be familiar with this, but we, we have been running a community survey. The link's up there. The survey closes at the end of July. We've had about 700 respondents to date. Uh, and I would ask you, if you haven't conducted the survey, uh, responded to the survey, please consider doing so. There's only a few days left, but, but your opinions would be valuable. Okay, that was a quick canter through. Happy to take any questions now or in the course of the next few days. Uh, but thank you for listening and back to you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Jamie. So um, any questions? Any hands up? Uh, any questions for Jamie? No, doesn't look like there is. So Excellent. again, Good. yeah, thanks, Jamie. I'd just like to really reiterate what Jamie said that that um, the success of this project relies on people sharing data, and and um, and we just ask that you just um, either advocate for the project or advocate for your clients about sharing data, or if you can make data available, please do. And if you have any issues, if there's any concerns, um, just let us know, and I'm sure we can come up with some solutions. Oh, there's a hands up. Some solutions uh, for um, uh, any any issues that you have. So we have a, a, a hands up from Annie. Uh, do you have a question for Jamie? Yeah, can you hear me? 
Yes. Oh yeah, I have a quick question. When uh, James uh, talked about uh, the gray cell, uh, gray cell, I was wondering what kind of uh, uh, projected uh, coordinate system or coordinate system was used to uh, have that kind of uh, grid. Do you want to answer that, Sorry. Jamie? <laughs> right. Oh. So, so which 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 slide are you talking about? This this. Uh, let me just wind back. Uh, I think in the fall uh, in the previous few slides. Yeah, hang on, let one, me find it. One which has a square, um, and uh, there are a lot of uh, grids in that square. Yeah, this one. I'll just hang on. The, the, this one. The, the slide right. next. Uh, this one. Yeah. Oh, hang on. I've I've got, I've got a very heavy touch on my mouse. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. So yeah, so you, you're you're asking what grid coordinate system that is based upon. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm going to now very deftly divert that question to the experts in the regional center who do this on a daily basis. So, so Kevin or Aya, could you pick that one up, please? Sure. So, uh, um, so, so the answer is uh, we use a WGS84 let long grid cell. So it's not it's not a it's not a square cell. It, it, it's a, it's a cell of latitudes and longitudes that changes shape as you go through um, the higher latitudes. So there is um, so the, the product we deliver is in terms of the grid is a WGS84 lat long uh, projection grid, and any statistic that you see um, is based on those cells of latitudes and longitudes. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank so, you. So to put things into context right now, um, I was going to talk about this in my talk, but the Jibco 2021 grid that's just been released, those cells are 15 arc seconds apart. So that works out about 480 meters at the equator apart. But mm. as you saw in Jamie's uh, presentation, the goal of CB2030 is to actually have a um, multi-resolution product. So the, the Jebco grid will be in four resolutions from 100 by 100 meters, which would be on the continental shelf, going down to 800 by 800 meter cells uh, and, and the ocean trenches. But again, that will be um, equivalent in degrees of latitude and longitude. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering. Thank you. Any other questions for Jamie? Oh, hi, um, Andy, could you put your, yes, thank you, put your hand down. Right, um, so thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll um, move on to the next item on the agenda, which is my presentation on um, uh, the status of the uh, CB20, of the South and West Pacific um, Centre. Um, so some of this might cover what Jamie has already uh, talked about, so apologies for that. So I just want to reiterate, in terms of the CB2030 project, the way that it works is we actually have four data centers that look after a part of the world. So the data center for the South and West Pacific, um, it's hosted in New Zealand, but you can see it's that purple area there. Our, our area is the entire South Pacific from 50 degrees south up to 10 degrees north. And then in the west of the Pacific, we extend up to include um, uh, uh, East Asia up to Japan, uh, but not into Russia. So that, that is the region um, that we cover um, at our responsibility for this data center. So let's talk about um, this area that, that we, we extend. It's, it's nearly 124 million square kilometers of ocean. Uh, in terms of area, it's the largest um, part of the ocean that any data center looks after. So it's a very, uh, very massive extent. And of that 124 million square kilometers, um, half of that is outside national jurisdiction. So there is a lot of ocean that, that um, is uh, nobody's, nobody's responsibility. And, and there are um, issues that we have to address about who's going to be mapping that um, if it's not a national body that's looking after it. We cover 39 countries and territories all the way from the small Pacific Island states, all the way through to um, the largest and most populous nation uh, on Earth. And we include um, the deepest parts of the ocean. Uh, we've got the Marianas Trench, which is in our water. 
Um, uh, and I know the slide shows a Kermadec trench, but in actual fact, Tonga Trench is the next deepest, which is um, 10,800 metres. But we also have the Kermadec Trench, which is over 10 kilometres. So we have all very deep ocean and we have very shallow ocean and, and small island states and large populous uh, nations. So it's a very diverse mix um, and that presents a lot of challenges to the centre um, in terms of achieving the goal of 100% mapped. Um, I don't like this diagram, but but it's useful to just kind of explain how the data flow works with these data centres. So if we start on the left of this diagram, we have data contributors, and these are people, which are, which are you people that are listening in. So it could be boats or vessels or national organisations or um, private um, non-government organisations that go out and collect the data. Now these data are either given um, directly to each of the regional centres, either as raw data files or gridded bathymetric products, or sometimes they're shared through to the IHO Data Centre for Digital Bathymetry, um, uh, which uh, also looks after the raw data. And then collectively, we in these regional centres will accumulate this data. Uh, and, and our job every year is to assemble all these different data sets um, Reprojected into the, the WGS84 lat long projected data set, gridded at whatever product uh, resolution that we need for that particular year, and deliver to the global centre a grid of our region. So we will deliver a grid of just the South and West Pacific region at whatever resolution is needed for that year. And it's the responsibility of the global data centre to assemble those four regional grids into the global centre. Now, um, one of the questions I often get is, uh, we can we we see show maps of where we have data, but how do we what do we use for those areas of black where there is no data? So the underlying data that we provide to Jebco is the SRTM grid. Um, now there's a talk later on, I think it's tomorrow, um, from one of the scientists who assembles that grid uh, and talking about how that's assembled. So we're not going to go into what the background grid is, but um, if you are interested, there will be a talk later on at this meeting uh, talking about how we actually assemble the background grid. In terms of our data centre here, um, it's, it's hosted in New Zealand. It's the actual, actual secretariat itself with the servers is hosted at Niwa in Wellington. I am the uh, head, centre head, and I have a, a data manager, hire repairers, who helps me with that. At, at the centre, we have in the past hosted um, Jebco alumni at the centre and summer interns and summer students that help out. Um, this year, due to the COVID pandemic, we've had no um, alumni or summer students, but um, we hope that all things being equal, the world will open up and we can welcome uh, these people back to our data centre to help out with, with the um, data assembly process. The centre is managed by a committee, um, and the committee is called the Technical Management Committee, and that is uh, representatives from NIWA, representatives from GNS Science, which is the New Zealand Government Institute for Geological Survey, and representatives from Land Information New Zealand, uh, which is a government department in New Zealand that, that hosts the New Zealand Hydrographic Authority. So we are, we're lucky in our centre that we have knowledge from the science community, Plus, we also have extensive knowledge from the hydrographic and um, safety of life at sea community too. So we actually bring together a lot of the expertise that, that covers basically all aspects of seabed mapping. And um, and and from that, we we report um, to the the global data centre, uh, which which manages the entire project. Just in terms of some software we use for those that are interested. Um, in terms of actually processing the data we get, as, as I said, a lot of the data we receive is raw multi-beam files and raw single-beam files. So we mainly use Chimera to process the data, but sometimes we use Keras HIPS. Uh, and from that, from those um, processing software, we generate rasters um, at, at whatever resolution the data supports. And to assemble those rasters into that, that regional product that we have to deliver uh, every year, we the main system we use is called ESRI Bathymetric Information System. It is a bathymetric database that sits on the ESRI platform. And what that does is that allows us to manage individual rasters and, and build metadata around those rasters. Uh, and that metadata contains things like um, who collected it, 
what instrument was used, what was the uh, frequency of the instrument, the dates, uh, and other information. And then we can have business rules that uses that metadata to decide when we assemble these grids together, which layer goes on top, which layer has precedence as ha of having a value within a cell. Uh, and that's managed through these rules uh, that, that do go through the metadata. Um, in terms of NIWA, uh, how we manage our metadata, we use Keras Bathy database, which is a similar product that Keras does. So for the New Zealand contribution to CB2030, we will use Keras to assemble those and make those decisions and then provide that raster to um, the, the data center to assimilate back into the South and West Pacific um, regional grid. Now, I would like to do a shout out to um, QPS. QPS uh, have provided um, the project with licenses for Chimera and Flydemus in order for us to actually do the, the bathymetric data processing and for visualization. So we thank um, QPS for their continued support uh, through this year. So um, let's talk about the GEBCO grid. Jamie's already talked about this. So, so, so to be clear, what we're driving for is this bathy topo raster product that you can get from jibco.net website. Um, currently, as I said, it's sitting at 15 arc second resolution, uh, which is about 480 meters at the equator. And of course, that changes as you move higher up in the latitudes. But um, the ultimate goal that we alluded to is going to be this multi-resolution product. Um, and, and, and the way that those numbers were devised, the 100 meter, 200 meter, 400 meter, 800 meter resolutions of the target uh, GEBCO grid were basically based on the average beam footprint uh, within a depth range for a modern multi beam system in installed on a surface vessel. Um, we're not taking into account ASVs or any other new technologies. It's all about the technology that exists now and what the average footprint is uh, based on technology that's based now. So if you have a look on the bottom left of your screen, you can see that, that ultimately by the year 2030, we as a South and West Pacific Centre will deliver to the Global Data Centre a grid that will look like that, where it's 100% mapped. Um, those colours represent the different resolutions um, that, that you see. But what we've got now, uh, you see on the bottom right, you can see what we have delivered for um, that has been used in the Jebco 2021 grid. So there's still a lot of black, there's still a lot of gaps. Um, and so again, here's another call to everyone who's listening. If you, uh, if you have data or you have access to data, um, please think about sharing your data so we can fill in those gaps. So in, just in terms of um, some basic statistics, and, and this will make sense as I move on. So in terms of those resolutions, we can see that, that um, about 13% of the ocean is sitting uh, on the continental shelf. That, that will be delivered at 100 by 100 meter resolution. We have 11% of the ocean is basically on the continental slopes. Uh, 70, about 73% of the ocean is actually in deep ocean basins. Um, and about 2.7, just under 3% comes in from the trenches. So those numbers are important as we look into this next slide here, which shows um, changes in progress over time. So we can see on the left of this histogram, we can see that when we started CB2030 um, in 2018, the GIBCO grid had just 6% of those cells come from real values. Now, these statistics I'm reporting here, um, they're color banded on for any one year. If you actually look at the data that's in the GIBCO grid, how much of those would meet those target resolutions? So anything in the light blue would meet the 100 by 100 meter resolution, and then the mid blue is 200 by 200 meter resolution. The darker blue is 400 by 400 meter resolution, and the, the purple is the 800 by 800 meter resolution. So we can see that when we started, 6%, um, mostly in the 400 meter resolution, which makes sense because then the JEBCO product was a 30 arc second grid, which is about a kilometer grid. In 2019, um, we increased the global coverage at the 14.6%. But we never calculated the statistics on the different resolutions, which is why it's just a solid blue. Last year, 2020, we got up to 19%. Um, big increase in the 100% resolution uh, data, which is great. And, and that means that we're getting those higher resolution products being delivered to Jebco. 
this year, as Jamie has mentioned, we're up to 20.6. Um, there's been a marked slowdown on last year, and, the, and there's lots of reasons for that. And the first most obvious reason is that the um, COVID-19 pandemic has um, grounded a lot of the fleet that would normally would have been out uh, get into the ocean. So we just haven't had the amount of vessel time this year collecting new data, and that, that has really strongly impacted on, on the growth. Um, but a second reason why we're having a slowdown is that we've actually getting close to exhausting the easily accessible data sets that um, are around. So in terms of the ones, the data sets that have been publicly available, we've basically almost finished harvesting all those. So what's left are data sets that we know exists, but are not yet willing to be shared to Jebco. So that's going to be um, a future um, uh, part of our plan is to try and talk to those people, those holders of data, and see if we can come up with some sort of arrangement where they are be willing to release the data to Jebco. Um, and, and the third reason why there's a decrease is what we have found is um, there's been a lot of repeat survey this year versus last year that's resulted in higher resolution products. So they've, they've um, been a lot of repeat surveys over areas that were maybe surveyed 10 years ago, but they've been resurveyed at high resolution and they've come into the system. So while the percentage of new seafloor covered has slowly increased in terms of the amount of data being delivered to the the data centers, there's been still a lot of data being delivered. It's just not necessarily in those gaps. And if we look at that percentages, um, I talked about before, 13% um, of the world is, is continental shelf. Uh, currently, right now, we're only capturing about 2% of that. And, and that, to me, says that um, there's a lot of data on the con on that nations have of continental shelves that they're not releasing to this because the amount of data that people map around their, their coastal states has got to be higher than 2%. Um, but we think that that's just for whatever reason, for strategic reasons, um, they're just not sharing that. So that's something that, that we, we as a project really have to work on. Uh, we can see on the continental slopes, it was 11% of the world as continental slopes. We've got nearly 3% of that world covered. And, and the deep ocean basins, um, at the 400 meter cell size, we've got 14%. If you remember from the previous slide, that number was 72%. So that's getting into the areas beyond national jurisdiction uh, where, where as a rule, um, national fleets don't normally go to because it's outside the EEZs. So um, we're hoping that there's some new initiatives, new technologies that will be coming online soon that will make those numbers change. Um, the only good news I see, well, it's not good news, but interesting news is in the deep ocean trenches where there was 2.7% of the world as deep ocean trenches, we've got nearly half of that covered already. So the deep ocean trenches seem to be really well covered, and I think that, that reflects, A, that they're scientifically very interesting, um, but also reflects the fact that there are actually active missions out there whose job it is to try and map those ocean deeps. So in terms of um, our centre, um, as we've mentioned, 20.6% of the world's seafloor is being mapped. Of that 20.6%, 23% of that comes from our region. So there are four regions uh, and we're just under a quarter um, of the world's map seafloor comes from our uh, region. And in terms of the coverage of our, of our South and West Pacific region, just under 20% has been covered. So 20.6% of the world has been mapped within our region, just under 20% has been mapped. And a lot of that um, actually reflects the fact that a lot of the data that we've received at the region was delivered for the original JEBCO requirements, which was 30 out seconds. So we have a lot of coarse resolution data that looks good on a map, but when you drill down into those high resolutions, the data cells aren't actually there yet. So a lot of people who have already delivered us data in the past, we are asking to please resubmit that data delivery, but at a high resolution. Um, so we can actually meet that those new targets. So just in terms of progress too, I'm going to show you some shots. Um, this is very New Zealand centric because um, it's my part of the world, so I know it. Just to show some um, vast improvements that we've made um, through the CB2030 project. Here's, here's a shot used from the JEPCO 2014 grid, which is where the CB2030 project started from. 
And, and we can see um, there's a nice new trench that's magically appeared in the, in the Geoco 2014 grid. Uh, and you've also noticed that at the bottom of the screen is a couple of nice craters that have appeared on, on the continental slopes. Um, I'm pleased to say that in the 2021 grid, they've gone. So that just reflects the fact that we actually have made a lot of progress um, over the years. Uh, we've really improved um, where we started from and, and we can actually see a much better resolution product. Um, if I switch back, that's where we started at December 2030. This is where we are now, a much nicer product. So we are definitely making vast improvements in, in the quality of the grids that we're delivering now. Just another shot again from New Zealand, um, looking uh, at the South Island of New Zealand, um, we have the Pacific plate on the bottom of the screen, looking towards the Australian plate to the top of the screen. That is where the Jebco grid was at the start of CB2030 through to now. Um, vast improvement. And, it, and it's, again, it's thanks to everyone who has donated data to the CB2030 project that we are getting big changes and big improvements in the quality of the product that we are delivering to the public. And, and here, this is a nice little um, use case of Jebco that I'm quite proud of. Um, March this year, there was in one day, in, in a, in, within a few hours, New Zealand had three um, major seismic events, greater than um, seven magnitude, um, including one that was 8.1, all were offshore, all within the space of five hours of each other. And <clears throat> the uh, when these earthquakes happened, um, our civil defence was able to issue um, some very detailed um, emergency plans, evacuation plans for certain coastal areas. And the reason why they can actually issue these um, highly detailed plans of coastal states is because um, the, 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 some, the modellers that, the, at Genius Science that did this were actually using the high resolution um, new Jebco products to actually look at the, and model the wave propagation uh, from these events. So from this animation, we can see as that 8.1 magnitude event happens and we're getting these wave heights coming through, we can see by including Jebco, we can actually see these waves and energies bouncing backwards and forwards between the uh, fore arc ridge and the back arc ridge along the subduction zone. And that changes how the energy gets um, propagated out towards New Zealand. And that's why certain parts of New Zealand coastline got higher wave heights than others. And that allowed civil defense to make those very detailed um, evacuation notices and plans um, so that everybody got safely away. And I'd just like to thank GNS Science for the slide, Dr. Bill Fry. Um, he leads uh, New Zealand's um, tsunami modeling response. Uh, and I'd like to thank him for letting us use uh, this slide for this presentation. Just um, gonna sum up with some key activities that we've had within the region this year. Um, this time last year, of course, we had our second annual meeting. It was held in late June 2020, 42 participants from 10 countries. That was the first of the uh, virtual meetings. Um, and uh, um, I think the, those uh, results and proceedings and videos for those are available on our centre website. So if you go to CB2030, um, if you just Google CB2030, you can actually drill down to our uh, South and West Pacific um, page and you can get the, the proceedings from last year's meeting and online videos are all available um, from our story map page. Some other key activities that we've held this year, um, I'm not going to go through them, but you can see uh, see them on that screen. Um, again, COVID-19 has really impacted how much outreach we can do around the region. Uh, there's been quite a few online meetings, um, key of which are some regional hydrographic meetings with IHO um, and some work with our seabed that we're quite proud of. There have been some in-person conferences that we've presented at, but they're all based in New Zealand because we, we are not in New Zealand. We're not allowed to, we're not easily, cannot easily travel overseas. Um, and a big shout out to, and I'm hoping that Eric King's going to be talking about this from the Falcor, um, the RV Falcor that was based in Australia um, in the new year. One January uh, was actually came out on a voyage exclusively for CB2030 to map the gaps. And, the, and they were literally picking into the new year for the start of the uh, ocean decay. So um, uh, hopefully Eric's gonna talk about that, but that to me is, um, is a huge thing. And again, thanks for the Falcor for that opportunity to um, help us with our CB2030 project. Um, again, just uh, gonna finish off with a couple of slides about um, a, another shout out. Please 
if, if you're listening, um, if you have data uh, and, and, and we really need data, um, please contribute, think about contributing to us. If you go to the cb2030.jibco.net website, uh, you can see there's a contribute data button on that main page. If you do have any questions, please just click that button um, there and you'll be given a little form to fill out um, that, that um, will tell us who you are and who you represent and then someone will get back to you and then we can have those um, discussions about how we can actually um, get your data into the system. And uh, just a thank you to all, all the sponsors and providers and especially a thank you to my um, TMC team from Niwa Genius Science and Land Information New Zealand. And thank you very much. And it's time for any questions for anybody. No questions, I left you all stunned. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, I would like to move on to the next item to the agenda, which is Mr. Stuart Kai uh, talking about um, the status of mapping within New Zealand. Um, Stuart, over to you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Um, Kia ora koutou. Uh, I'm Stuart Kai, Manager of Hydrographic Survey here at Toi Tutu Whenua uh, Land Information New Zealand. Uh, so I'll just give you an update on the uh, what New, New Zealand is up to. Um, and as the as Kevin's pointed out, we are the New Zealand Hydrographic Authority and uh, responsible for charting nearly 25 million square kilometres of the ocean in our region. And that extends really from the uh, Pacific Islands, the Cook Islands, down to the Ross Sea in Antarctica, so quite a uh, quite a large backyard that we need to look after. So you may well be very familiar with the LINS data service. Uh, this is where we um, make our bathymetric information discoverable. Um, all our holdings are put up here and uh, for people to be able to discover and uh, request access to. And these cover there in the image there, we're showing the uh, bathymetric surface models. So from our hydrographic surveys, the data uh, being uh, being made available as a, as, a, as a surface model and also any sounding sheets that maybe uh, have been scanned and georeferenced uh, that go to that are used then to compile our nautical charts. So all that data is, is available uh, for uh, for um, access and uh, request through from from LINS and just a just an example of an analog sounding sheet. These are now of, a, of an era gone by. We are now moving to a more of a, a digital approach. Um, so these these sounding sounding sheets. Um, good luck to anybody who wants to capture those soundings, but uh, they are certainly available to anybody who wishes to, to undertake that that mammoth tasks. Um, one of the more easier or straight, straightforward ways of uh, getting data, sounding data into a database is extracting it then from our electronic navigational charts, the ENC, as uh, shown there on the left, um, as would be shown on a, on a bridge display. But those sounding points are again on, available through the LDS and for download uh, in various, uh, various data formats. So again, all this information readily available. Uh, similarly, the surfaces um, are available as well um, through through the data service. We provide um, a surface at varying varying resolutions, generally the highest that we can achieve, and that uh, varies from about one meter to two meters. And we also provide point cloud data as well at high resolution. So, vast majority of this data is from multi-beam mecha sounders. We will also have uh, bathymetric lidar uh, data sets as well. Um, the grids that are available from the LDS, they're available in various formats, uh, simple X, Y, Z or an ASCII, ASCII or GeoTIFFs. So whatever format is available and um, is uh, easily to be consumed within, within any database. Um, and again, these are available, uh, the X, Y, Z are available in, in lat long, um, WG, WG34 generally. 
Um, so this data is available, there is metadata that goes with it, and there is a data dictionary that helps users identify what they want, how they can access it, and what format, and make those requests through to, uh, to LINs. And I understand that we do a regular update to uh, the SORPAC Center, and um, most recent one would have included all the all recent surveys up through to the end of maybe the, the financial year. So looking ahead to future surveys, we have a, an annual uh, hydrographic survey program, and uh, we are now planning for the next three years. Uh, the graphic there shows the areas in green that have been completed, uh, say over the last uh, four years, and uh, looking out for the next three years, the areas in, or well, three plus years, the areas in red, the locations in red are being worked on. And again, all the data that we collect from this, uh, not just bathymetry, but we also collect backscatter, seafloor backscatter and seafloor water column, although not necessarily a direct input into a GEBCO product, all this information is uh, readily available. Uh, and something that um, I'm certainly very pleased that we've been able to to achieve right before the end of the financial year, just to squeeze out a few a few unspent dollars. Uh, very thankful for uh, CBA 2030, um, who raised this this opportunity uh, to uh, collect some satellite drive bathymetry uh, in the Pacific region, and Lynn's were able to identify a few areas, three atolls around the Cook Islands. Uh, that we previously hadn't had mapped through a regional project, which I'll talk about again a little bit tomorrow, which was the Pacific Regional Navigation Initiative, um, which collected a satellite drive bathymetry around about nine islands and atolls. So this was an opportunity uh, to collect further information uh, to islands not previously covered by other projects. So this is great, uh, fantastic data sets that have been collected uh, in areas that uh, haven't been surveyed for many decades. Uh, and again, all of the um, data that's been collected here and through the uh, PRNI program, which includes satellite drive bathymetry, bathymetric LIDAR, and multiple mecha sounder data, uh, again, has all, all been provided through to the center. Uh, so really moving on and uh, we talked about making sure that we're sharing data and making it available and discoverable. Um, Linz is certainly uh, following that, that rule in terms of uh, collect once, use many times, uh, which really has the efficiencies and cost savings, not only domestically, but also internationally. And how this data has benefits feeding into the CBA 2030 uh, pr uh, program, as it now is, um, and also through to the IHO data center for digital bathymetry. Uh, however, this does come uh, with a commitment and requires a commitment of having uh, open data principles, which fortunately the New Zealand government does. Um, we're able to provide that. So. Um, uh, there is that um, drive and encouragement to other nations to uh, to be able to support those those principles in making data uh, not only freely uh, available, freely available, and uh, in in cost, but also with uh, without any uh, strings attached through through any licensing agreements. So maybe a, a quick a quick run through uh, of what we are up to. Um, if there's any questions, more than happy to um, to take them. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, and I'd just like to um, do a, a big thank you to, to Land Information New Zealand. Um, they are actually uh, fantastic providers of data for the CP2030 project, and they've really made a big difference, especially in the Pacific Islands. Um, releasing all their, their native resolution um, products for multi-beam and all those um, other, other platforms. And it really makes a huge difference. Um, one thing that we, we have received from other hydrographic organizations has been ENC only sounding data. And, and while it's great that, that hydrographic officers have released the ENC data, it, it really is one only one sounding point per every kilometer or whatever. It's not really a, a, an adequate um, replacement for the native data that lies underneath. So a big thank you to Linz uh, for the hard work they do. Do we have any questions for Stuart and Linz?
No, no hands raised. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. And, and just for anyone who's listening, if you do think of questions, um, you can either put the questions back into the chat oh, um, and we can ask, uh, or you can just email it to us um, uh, at, at, uh, at, our, at our email address so we can get them done. There's a hand raised by Vaughan. Vaughan, have you got a question? Yes, I was just going to, hello everyone. I was just going to ask Stuart um, what progress is happening in the Antarctic region, if there's a program to collect more data there. So at the moment there, there isn't. Um, Antarctica is a, a very challenging area. Um, uh, we've suddenly, well, over the last, I think maybe the last time we were down New Zealand's were down there, must be nearly 20 years ago, I guess, or maybe um, not, not quite that, that far, but certainly that's a, a challenging area. We don't have on the horizon plans for, for that. Um, a lot of our funding is generally for New Zealand waters, um, so we will certainly be looking to have conversations with maybe other uh, organisations, maybe talking to um, Antarctica New Zealand, possibly MFAT in terms of um, uh, support in, in collecting uh, data in those areas. We have um, completed a hydrographic risk assessment for the sub-Antarctic islands. Uh, one of the slides there indicated a couple of areas around the Snares Island and Campbell Islands. Uh, for a survey. Um, the the idea with the risk assessment model was that would include the Antarctic region and uh, although we haven't necessarily completed that, that part of the risk assessment that would um, that would certainly be something that would drive to a certain extent for safe navigation in primarily but um, where where hydrographic surveys would be required. Awesome. Thanks for that. Uh, any other questions? No more hands raised. Right. Um, moving on to um, the next item of the agenda, which is um, the last one before the break from um, Yukari and Jamstack. Um, so just to give everyone a heads up, so we'll have Yukari's presentation on the Jamstack, but after Yukari's finished, um, if we get everybody to turn on your cameras uh, and we'll get some um, photographs of everybody's smiling faces uh, before we go into the break. So we'll do that after this Jamstack talk. So um, moving along, Yukari, are you ready to present? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, I'll try to my slides to share. But this is not a presentation mode. Are you? Can you see and hear? Yes, we can hear. Yes, uh, we realise it's not presentation mode, but I am okay, okay. with that, and we can hear you. I do that. Uh, how about this? Still the same. No, that's great. That's perfect. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Jamie and Kevin, inviting me. Uh, I'm Yukari Kido, belonging to Jamstack and uh, Marine uh, Operation Department. And I also involved in a team of uh, this uh, uh, right side brochures, mathematical seafloor geomorphology team. Uh, since uh, October 2019. So today I will brief uh, uh, introduce and also explanation of how to collaborate and how to contribute uh, by Jamstack to the Nippon Foundation JEVCO CBET 2030 project. Uh, the Mathematical Seafood Geomorphological Research Project, which started in October 2019, uh, had successfully improved the resolution of C4 geomorphological image analysis by deep learning, machine learning, and, and the sophistication of C4 geomorphological image analysis by sparse modeling. 
And this is a member of this project. Uh, right, uh, Eiji Kikawa, the middle big person, is a leader. And uh, research staff, Takahumi, Yoichi, Tatsu, Daisuke, Mitsuko, are research staff. And uh, I and Junji are technical staff. So we all participate in uh, this project and the uh, CBET uh, 2030 project to try to contribute and the basimetry data around the Japan collection and uh, NOAA ITO Darwin collaboration has been established. And also I will present future work. And just this uh, year, um, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for SDGs has begun. There, clean sea, healthy and uh, resilient sea, predictable sea, productive sea, safe sea, sea open to all, and uh, attractive sea with dreams. There are seven targets. In other words, recent sea conditions have not met the seven goals. So we just said there are some actions and also related the topics on the JAMSEC web pages. Also, our Shiba 2030 project are collaborative with this uh, UN decade for SDGs. And this is update since last uh, Southwestern Pacific Regional Mapping Conference of last year. And uh, international affair, we attended the crowdsource basimetry working group number 10 that was uh, held in March, the end of March and April. And the GeoHab meeting of this uh, May and uh, JEBCO GRID 2021 already Kevin and uh, uh, Mike uh, introduced. Uh, we hope to contribute continuously <laughs> for this uh, JEPCO grid project. And the domestic networking is uh, recently we had a big uh, meeting with uh, Japan Coastal Guard Hydrographic Office. Uh, the Hydrographics and the Oceanographic Department of the Japan Coast Guard is a formal desk for a uh, coordination engine of Japanese seabed basimetry data. Today, maybe Sunia and uh, Ogasan from uh, Oceanographic Department uh, attended this meeting. So, JAMSTEC is sharing information with the Japan Coastal Guard, uh, Japan Oceanographic Data Center, uh, Japan Coastal Guard, is collecting basimetry data using six research vessels and it's cooperating with JEBCO's grid making progress process. And in recent years, we had some uh, published and presentation related to machine learning. Uh, I will show you the next slide. Hidaka et al. Geoinformatics uh, already published and uh, presentation at the AGU online meeting last year and NOAA JAMSTEC Collaborative Workshop and the JPGU, that is Japan Geoscience Union 2021 held last, last month, and also join Forum 2021, and also open the website update. That is our recent uh, activities. And this is a machine learning uh, explanation slide. I am not a person in charge of this research, but to try to explain. So in recent years, deep learning, which is a machine learning technology that uses multi-layered neural networks, has been attracting attention in various fields of academia and industry. We have succeeded in getting higher resolution images so, for example, uh, deep learning approaches for the uh, lower explanation of this to super resolution uh, basimetric chart using uh, uh, three research vessels. For example, this is the area of Okinawa trough 
uh, Yokosuka, Mirai, and Natsushima, uh, different vessels uh, combined uh, training data set and uh, creating into a right side 100 meter or 50 meter higher resolution breeding bathymetry data. This is based on Hidaka et al. 2021 publications. And uh, also, uh, five types of deep learning architectures that perform image super resolution are implemented and tuned for the super topographic map. So this is for the central Okinawa trough acquired by JAMA State Research Vessels. The figures are, this is just examples of the result of super resolution of 100 meter and 50 meter grid for 3.2 kilometer square area. The currently, we are proceeding with the development of machine learning technology. Maybe that can be applied to a wider area. So this is a machine learning project uh, process uh, improvement of it so far. And the next one is a JAMSTEC database site. Since uh, uh, this is JAMSTEC database Darwin sites and collaborate with NOAA uh, viewers, map viewers, IHO DCDB site. So since last June 2020. So we had a collaborate with the NOAA and the Darwin site. And the Darwin means that next slide I will show you. This is JAMSTEC Darwin database site for general public. But unfortunately, we attacked a severe security incident this middle of March. So currently offline of this Darwin site, we are very, very sorry. So after the incident uh, uh, and the security will be fixed, the problem fixed, we will hope to uh, open for general public again within this uh, month, this month or next uh, or at the end of uh, August. So the, this is the final update is as of 12th March and uh, cruise data like this. And we can also uh, accumulate and uh, register and cruise, not only cruise data, but dives, observation data, CTD and XBT and uh, ADCP, other one, and also marine geophysics data, including bathymetry in more than five, uh, 1150 cruises, including this database. And also you can download from each cruise it one by one for raw data to process the data. And one slide back, this is a NOAA NGDC uh, data viewer site. Now we can, uh, NOAA is very, very kind to create a Japan layer and the Japan layer please visit this site and then click Japan. You can see the Jamstack Darwin data set, uh, the blue colored and green colored and the orange colored truck line. This is since last July. So this one, I asked some uh, person in charge of this programmers to create a new program, this middle. If uh, this is a flow chart, uh, through browser of NOAA, IHO, uh, some data demand, then new program check the cache data is exist or not. If not, uh, ask Darwin server to the area who interested in to display and then get image data back. And then new program can change at the mapping projection and fit to NOAA site and then pass back to response. That is a flow chart of a new cache program. So this program uh, improvements 
some uh, uh, points. For example, improve uh, display speed much faster and utilize standard world map service application available to select mapping display. Yeah, because Darwin and NOAA IHO are the different mapping uh, projection. So this program can change the map projection. And still under consideration for rare display, cache and tile for other marine geophysics, uh, for example, gravity and magnetics, such kind of uh, uh, information also additional in, additionally uh, integrated. That will be still under consideration. And this is, uh, we attended this January uh, Jebco week. Mm, I deeply impressed this January Jeb Jebco week because of the keynote speaking and UN decade of ocean science and the TSCOM and the scope and the scram and uh, also um, for these five days, very, very detailed discussions. And I was deeply impressed and uh, I, I know, understand the structure of the JEPCO and the CBET 2030 project. And the final date, we attended the Teledyne Carries Technology Training course, that is AI and bathymetry cleaning tools and uh, how to gap, how to uh, map the gap and how to do the data cleaning. That is very, very uh, interesting trainings. That is a uh, Jevco week. Some person also attended this Jevco week symposium, I think. And uh, this is the Jevco 2020 grid coverage. Uh, I explained this map uh, for last uh, Japan Geo Union science meeting. And then one of the researcher showed me uh, this global tsunami terrain model. He introduced me uh, because of he used the uh, uh, JEBCO 2019 data set. So based on this JEBCO data, he created a newly designed uh, tsunami terrain model about 50 meter interval flood resolution. So I also asked him why you don't you use the JEPCO 2020 or 2021 is recently released. Uh, he said uh, because 2019 it's much more clear and uh, uh, less uh, data errata. 2020 version is some gaps and uh, track lines and other platform track lines and uh, boundary. And there are some uh, uh, data gaps and uh, so on. So I also asked him, please input such kind of feedback. Then we will improve our future uh, grading data sets. That is for the last, last week, uh, last month, JPGU question and answer and uh, taking contact with researchers. So this is my final slide and the next step of mathematical ship or geomorphological team will be uh, attend, for example, CrowdSource Basimetry Working Group 11 and JEBCO Grade 2022 contribution and also collaborate with grid projects with Japan Coastal Guard and uh, program updating, and also publication and presentation will be updating. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to have your question and the comments. Thank you. Thank you, Akari, that was very interesting. Um, just, I just have a, a couple of questions, just in terms of um, Darwin, Yes. can you give any indication how long in time between a, a voyage um, coming in and that data being made available in Darwin? Are we talking a year or I mean, how long in time does it take to get the data processed and made available for download? 
Yeah, we are very sorry for currently offline. So anytime, please ask me. I will provide you any data set. But uh, we will soon uh, at least two months. For okay, the oh, that's fast. Yeah, so please wait for a moment. Or please contact me or directly which data you need. Okay, that, 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 just, it's just, just out of curiosity, that was all. Um, um, and, and in terms of that conversation you had about this with the tsunami modeler, yes. like the Gibco 2019, that's that's actually yes. a very interesting comment, and I hadn't heard that feedback. Yes. But but there is there is actually a, a reason why that is the case. So in 2019, when we built um, Gibco, what we used to do was when we had real data. Mm. Um, we used to then um, interpolate the edges into the background to make to smooth it out. Yeah. Um, but from 2020, we mm. chose not to do that. So oh, from 2020, it. we literally just put in new data um, mm -hmm. over the top of the background. And that means that if you have a voyage that where, where the seafloor is significantly different than what used to be there, you'll get either a trench of the seafloor or you, you get a break you, you would get a break in, in the bathymetry and that and that is why the modeler is getting those troubles mm -hmm. so it's a great feedback and we will need to address that but but the reason is that we actually changed the way we built Jebco 2020 versus how we built Jebco 2019 um, but you anyway, know that was very interesting so if 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 that, that researcher wants to talk to us um uh if you could forward the details i'm more than happy to have a conversation and and get a product that's actually good for i mean good for him uh, he's done a lot of work and we congratulate him on, on actually doing that work um mm -hmm. but if he does any any concerns or anyone else who's listening has concerns about how the uh or, or questions about how the jibco grid is built um please just feel free to contact us and we can um explain it or work out uh, a way around any issues they have so does you anybody else have a question for Yukari? Yeah. Please put your hand up now. That's a very good comment, Kevin. I'm very happy to contact with him again. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. So I'm seeing no further questions for you, Yukari. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Oh, Greatly appreciate it. I appreciate So on the agenda, we've got a break. Um, so before we have a break, can I get everybody to turn on your cameras, please? And um, and we get Haya to take a screenshot of everybody. And Haya, if you, can you let us know, please, um, when that's all done? Smile. Hmm. OK, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Vaughan Stegpool, and I'm chairing the next session. So I'm a geophysicist at GNS Science here in Wellington, New Zealand, and I'm also a member of the technical oversight group for the South and West Pacific Mapping Centre, for which um, Kevin is the director. Um, <clears throat> we have a series of three talks this afternoon um, from around that region, the South and West Pacific region, and I, um, I'll give 15 minutes for everyone to talk plus uh, questions, and we should finish about 10 minutes before the hour today. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and uh, we'll see that and we'll be able to address that question, but don't forget to lower your hand as well. Okay. So um, once the first the first talk today is from Son Urian from the from Kiribati. Uh, he's a hydrographic surveyor from the Ministry of Transport, Information and Technology Communications there, and his talk is about seafloor mapping in Kiribati. Tion, are you available to talk? <laughs> Yes, we can. We can hear you, Son. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, my internet is not too good, so I'll, I'll try to go uh, as quickly as I can with my presentation. So I'll just share my screen if that's okay. Yes, please. So uh, thank you again for the invitation to, to speak in this, in this forum. So my name is Swan, as you mentioned. I'm the, uh, currently the head of the unit for the current Ministry of uh, uh, Transport and the Environment. My talk today will, uh, will be focusing on the activities that's currently happening in Kiribati regarding uh, secret mapping and the updating of our notebook charts. Uh, so, this will be the outline of my presentation, uh, just a brief, brief background of the project, um, what we are currently doing, and some of the challenges that then uh, what we learned, uh, we've learned so far. <clears throat> so Kiribati is a is, is a is quite a extensive uh, nation that covers um, three million square kilometers of ocean, uh, with this uh, three, thirty-three islands spread across a um, um, large uh, territory of ocean, and um, we're all uh, low lying and very um, vulnerable to. Um, sea level rise, climate change, um, and, all. and then um, we, we rely heavily on uh, on imported goods. So shipping is is a real is a real um, important, really important to us. Uh, we have very uh, limited land and land resources as well. Um, there's not much uh, uh, space um, on on the islands, and also with the growing population. Uh, Capital of Tarawa, which is highlighted in the star here, yeah, it's one of the most uh, highly populated places uh, in the Pacific and in the world as well. So, <clears throat> in terms of uh, notable charting in Kiribati waters, uh, a lot of our charts uh, they were published in the 1950s and 1960s, and. Uh, None, none of these charts are, are sufficient enough uh, the details to allow for the vessels to safely uh, navigate uh, So one of the major challenges that the government uh, gave us, uh, given that they, they realized the importance of uh, shipping uh, and uh, for mobilization of goods, they embarked on our project to, uh, to begin updating the notable charts. And fortunately, in 2019, uh, uh, what really gave, uh, gave us a good boost was the was the data that was provided by the uh, through the uh, Commonwealth Marine Economies Program. They provided us with the satellite derived bathymetry data, which uh, is in collaboration with uh, the UK uh, They helped us to plan out. Uh, um, some of the surveys that we that was needed for uh, selected islands for Kiribati, <clears throat> and so what uh, what resulted was a project um, which was uh, we referred to uh, the project name is the Kiribati Infrastructure Investment Program, and the objective of this project was to was to improve sort of the connectivity between the islands and to create more um, diversity in terms of economic activities and to lessen the, the burden that the um, overcrowding was happening in the South and North and sort of distribute uh, the populations uh, further out into the islands as infrastructure for maritime um, infrastructure uh, improves. And so we're very lucky to um, sort of uh, gain the support and of uh, the World Bank in Asian Development Bank. There's a key uh, 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 will be funding this project. So under this project, uh, the, the main component uh, of this project is, is to develop the outer islands uh, maritime infrastructure. First, uh, the phase. The first phase is to conduct hydrographic surveys. And so, given the, the remoteness of the islands and the and budget constraints, 
to not able to do all of the items and give them some selected for strategic items that was strategic development of And so what will be involved in this project will be airborne and respiratory surveys for all islands. And so the four islands mentioned here on the map are Bayang, which is closer to the main capital, and we have the, the three other islands that are further, further south. Uh, of the islands of the capital. So, part of the project, um, aside from uh, collecting data, is also for capacity building. As currently, we, we do not have the capacity to do the hydrographic surveys uh, ourselves. So, in, uh, in order to achieve the project uh, objectives, we uh, another project funding we've contracted UK to, to manage the, the hydrographic surveying uh, component of the, of the project. So we've been working uh, closely with UK to this. So UK to is not currently uh, contracted by the government to handle the management and the technical side of the hydrographic component. Um, <clears throat> The other provisions uh, for plastic building needs for, for this project. So, we really will look forward to, um, to as we work um, forward to this uh, project. And so, the, one of the major challenges um, that we face, of course, is COVID 19. So, if, if we went for the pandemic, we would have started uh, surveys already in the islands. So, so that is one major challenge. Another challenge is that um, hopefully there will be, uh, by the time we're ready to do the data acquisition, there will be people available, or, uh, companies available that uh, do not have too much of their plate already to help with our mapping. And so, uh, lessons learned uh, so far. Um, we hope the hydrographic terrain component of the project will finish uh, is a two-year uh, project. And so far, based on what we've learned is um, you know, how much it costs to, to actually map the models of the US and um, how we can move forward with uh, uh, improving the uh, chart information and providing those charts. And not just this, uh, not in, in line of this, we also uh, um, you know the while the technical, um, there are technical components required to finish the project, there are also um, other sort of hidden um, processes that I think are important, especially for small iron like ours, like the procurement processes and how we deal with zone of violence and contracts. So this is something that we've learned along the way. And hopefully, it's something that we can further. And thank you, and my apologies. We have very bad internet here, so I hope it's okay. my message is um, It's okay, son. Um, can I ask you a question? You, you say you got um, the UKHO to do a satellite derived bathymetry survey. To what water depths did that work? Did you get information from that? So it was mainly around the Liverpool, and uh, so it's about 20 meters. So the algorithms are not that big. So it's mainly around the, just the islands, the islands themselves and the shallow regions. Up to about five, 10, 10, 30 metres, did you say? Yes. Um, well, some of those have uh, 30 metre depths and they were able to capture. Okay. So I think the, the hydro. Uh, the, Vessel based and the LIDAR surveys will be a good to way to, to, to uh, calibrate those, those results. Okay, thank you. But does anyone else have any questions? Please raise your hand. Doesn't look like anyone else does. Thank you, Song, for that talk. It was very good. Uh, our next. Yes, and sorry for the slide. Yep. Our next guest speaker is Julian Collot. 
Julian is a marine geophysicist at the Geological Survey of New Caledonia and he will be giving us a talk on progress and update of the bathymetric atlas of New Caledonia. Are you ready to go Julian? Uh, hello, hi Vaughan, thank you. So I'll, I'll start my talk. Um, I have to share my screen first, how do I do that? It's a little button next to the leave button. Don't get them mixed up. OK, I think I got it. Is that it? Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Is it the correct screen? I guess so. It looks okay. okay. I will give a very short talk about um, a project we have here in New Caledonia to um, update the bathymetric atlas of New Caledonia. So this work is, is uh, uh, led by someone called Vishnu Kartikeyan, um, who is uh, actually at sea today doing bathymetry. So he, this is why I'm, I'm presenting um, on behalf of Vishnu. And it's his work. To, he has about a two year contract with uh, within a collaboration with Ifremer, which is the uh, French um, equivalent of NIWA, I would say and myself at the Geological Survey of New Caledonia, which is more or less the equivalent of GNS in New Zealand. Um, so we are uh, doing this project together and I will show you um, a few. So this is just a reminder of where New Caledonia is in the Southwest Pacific, but I guess uh, you all know. Um, this is also a reminder of what New Caledonia is because it is uh, so New Caledonia is part of the French Republic. Um, and the agreements that were signed in 1998 gave to New Caledonia a very special status uh, with where New Caledonia has all the powers um, uh, independently from the French state, except for the regalian powers, which is the defense and justice and a few others. Um, <clears throat> this is just so the, the status of New Caledonia. Uh, so today New Caledonia is under French sovereignty, but it has its own government, its own provinces, and it actually votes for its own laws. <clears throat> so what happens uh, in New Caledonia when bathymetric data is acquired in the EZ? Um, if it is uh, a French vessel, it directly goes uh, to, the, to the French national database. If it is not a French vessel, then you need a special authorization from New Caledonia, and it goes through uh, the uh, natural park uh, called the Natural Park of the Coral Sea, which gives authorizations for these uh, data to be acquired. Also, all the data are transmitted to the uh, to the French Navy. Um, so this is the EZ of, of the end ECS of New Caledonia, which is 1.45 million square kilometers. And this is a map of um, the uh, the data we were we had in our databases in 2019. Um, so about roughly one third of the EZ and ECS is covered uh, in multi-beam uh, bathymetric data. Um, but um, these data were not organized in a proper database. There was uh, a few maps, a few DEMs that existed, but not a proper database. So um, the, the whole idea of this project was to um, um, so which is, was led by uh, Vishnu, whose, whose picture is just here, um, is to do first an, an data inventory and gathering of all the data, uh, structure it into a, a database, and then do uh, processing or reprocessing of data, either recent data or old data that we want to reprocess, and then to produce a set of DMs, and uh, finally to diffuse it online and through maps. Um, so the data inventory was, uh, so just to, to mention, this work started in September last year and it will end sometime in March 2022, or maybe a bit later. Um, uh, so the way we did to find all the data inventory it is first of all, get back to all the authorizations that were given for any survey that was conducted in New Caledonia and from there, go and see if the people who did the acquisitions did furnish the data to New Caledonia. Um, we also looked at all the ship schedules that we knew had multi-beam 
um, uh, equipments, such as so ships from France, but ships from New Caledonia, ships from New Zealand, Australia, and other. We had also Japanese ships that came around. And also by um, exchanging with uh, local collaborators, such as Australia and New Zealand, for example, on sharing uh, data. And also we have like uh, we have a research vessel called Alice in New Caledonia, who's about a 30 meter long ship, which, which is equipped with a uh, multi-beam. And as you, uh, that's the case in New Caledonia, often the ship goes to do um, science, uh, scientific work. It gets authorizations to do this, but bathymetric data is not the um, primary data that is acquired. So often the, the fact that bathymetry is acquired is not even really declared. So we actually went back to all those ships and all those schedules and uh, verified that the ship had or not acquired data. We actually found a lot, a lot of data that were not in databases, often even still on the ships, and got this data back. So this is an example of research vessel La Talente that did a few voyages uh, in 2019. So these were, uh, uh, they had authorizations to do this. We had the data and uh, we, we got the data. This is another example of research vessel Alice I was talking about. And these, most of these data, I'd say maybe 95% of these data here uh, were not declared as bathymetric data. So they were unofficially still on the, um, the, the hard drives on the ship. We, we got them back and now we will uh, process them and, and get them into the database. Just so you know, th this often happens when you have people, for example, doing biological cruises that are studying biodiversity. They need to turn on this, this, the swath to know what they're looking at, but they just use it um, on the screen on the ship. They will not get the data and then process it and, and use it. So we did, we got all those data from these uh, cruises. Then we, we are still thinking about the uh, way the database will be structured. So um, we're going through something with um, where we want to have all the existing data, especially the, the dot all data, uh, and all the other versions of data for, for the French system, we have data that is MBG and uh, that are that are processed. We will also have a whole GIS um, suite of uh, products that will come with this uh, database, navigations, a set of um, grids. Uh, and we also uh, so um, furnish metadata by respecting the INSPIRE standards from the European Union. Just an example of processing and reprocessing. So this is done with the Globe, a Globe uh, software, which is a software that is developed by Ifremer to process SWATH data. Just to mention that it's free and, and it's downloadable on their website. Um, and this is just an example here on the map of a large surveys that were conducted in the 90s and, and 2000s within the frame of the Zoneco program. And at that time, the processing that was done on the multi data was more or less only automatic or by filtering. What we presently do today is manually uh, do the, uh, the processing. So we're going back through all those old surveys to see if we can get a bit more out of them, especially in terms of resolution. These um, data, uh, they, were, they were acquired with the EM12 um, uh, echo sounder and we at that time, they did about 100 meter resolution grids. And today, in many places, we can get down to 50 meter res resolution with the uh, with some processing uh, a little better that was that what was done at that time. Um, so that's just an example of, of the um, Globe software developed by Ifremer that we use to uh, process the, the data and, um, and yeah. Um, and then the diffusion of the data. So we have here, in New Caledonia, so, something called GeoRep. This is something that has online not only bathymetry, but every geographical data in New Caledonia uh, is on this platform. Uh, so if you're looking for, for example, all the mining permits that exist in New Caledonia, you will find them on this website. You, anything that is geographic is here and we will. So for today, there's only the 100 meter grid that is on this um, platform and is, that is downloadable, but we'd like to have the whole database on there with um, all the information of each survey, um, where do they come from, what, sh what ship did the acquisition, 
and so on. So that's the associated downloading tool where um, you can select your data and download um, the grids. And this is all um, for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julian. Very beautiful. Um, beautiful data. Uh, has anyone got any questions of Julian about his talk? Kevin Mackay. Yes, uh, bonjour, Julian. I just, no. um, I just, uh, just want to double check that I understood it. The, the database that you're designing, is that yeah. going to be storing the bathymetric products or is it storing the raw data as well? The raw data as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. This is typically something we've been struggling so hard when you want to come back to the original data to uh, reprocess it or to do new grids that now we're going to um, uh, gather everything in the database. Yeah. Awesome, bonjour, thank you. Yeah. And, and Julian, these data will be shared with TIPCO uh, CB2030? So yes, except um, there are rules in terms of confidentiality for, for example, voyages that happens less than two years ago. Um, the data is still under the uh, control of the head scientists of those cruises. So these obviously cannot, but we will manage those and make them available as soon as they um, go through the equivalent of the moratorium um, period. Yes, OK, thank you very much. Um, one thing that I thought was quite interesting there and might be a discussion point later on, uh, Kevin, is the um, discovery of undeclared bathymetric data and yeah. how there could be a great resource out there in the future that yeah. we might be able to tap. But I'll get on to discussing that later because we've probably got time to for our next talker now, which is Eric King. Um, <clears throat> Eric is Director of Operations of the Schmidt Ocean Institute. If Julian stops sharing now, we can okay. move over to Eric and Eric can take control of the talk and his talk is about the Institute's mapping in the Pacific. Where you go Eric. Don't forget to unmute. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, you sound good. Great, well, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to present again here. Uh, it's uh, been quite a year, I think, for uh, many of us for lots of reasons. And what was most interesting is actually just having that wonderful uh, presentation about the Kiribati, considering um, our ship was just mapping and exploring um, at the edge of, of Kiribati, actually, just a, a few weeks ago in the Phoenix Island protected area. And I'll, I'll mention that in a few minutes, but um, uh, uh, for those that, that aren't familiar with our organization, the, the quick background is that uh, we are a, a philanthropically funded uh, institute that operates primarily um, an oceanographic research vessel called a Falcor. And uh, uh, we have spent uh, a considerable amount of time, actually um, about 450 days um, around Australia in Australian waters around all four coasts, um, doing a variety of uh, exploratory work with our, our ROV system and, and, and doing quite a bit of mapping. And uh, thinking about this, uh, this uh, effort that we're looking at now with, uh, with Seabed 2030, and, uh, and some of the ways that we as an organization uh, can contribute to that, uh, we, we actually uh, spent a considerable amount of time actually uh, last year and this year uh, uh, providing a bathymetry data uh, to, to the CBIT 2030 program. And I'll talk a little bit about that here. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, I, I do always want to appreciate and thank those that are funding this entire program for us, um, our founders, uh, Wendy and Eric Schmidt, 
Um, uh, we are not a, a for hire a commercial operation. We operate uh, year round our ship and our ROV, uh, providing uh, these platforms uh, to the scientific community um, at, uh, at, no, at no cost. And, and all the data that we collect um, has to be made uh, um, immediately available to the public or as close to it as we can. And uh, uh, two year moratoriums are things that uh, oh, we sometimes frown upon. We try to get the data into the hands of those that need it as quickly as possible. But it's through the, uh, the, the financial contributions of, um, of this couple that we're able to do what we do uh, year round. And our primary assets, as I mentioned before, um, is it a, a, an 83 meter ship that, uh, that is, uh, just arrived in the United States, actually, uh, just a couple of days ago. But as I mentioned, it's been spending quite a bit of time uh, in the Pacific and in Oceania. And then an ROV that we built um, that uh, lives with the ship. And, uh, and of course, we take that wherever we go and that's available uh, for the scientific community. And a lot of what we do is uh, we, we map during the day or we map at night and we and we dive the other half of the day. So uh, thinking about uh, you know, what uh, the progress to date with CPED 2030, but only specifically uh, January of last year through through now, um, uh, what have we been able to contribute um, specifically in, uh, related to, uh, to CPED 2030? Um, and that's 18 science cruises in, in transits, where we were able to collect about uh, uh, 210,000 kilometers, square kilometers of the seafloor that uh, we were uh, surveying or, or data collecting and exploring and discovering from uh, less than 100 meters, and in some cases around 40 meters, to over, over 4,000 meters. The majority of those cruises that we did uh, with the different scientific groups and we're out uh, about 30 days at a time, uh, just one um, expedition, one cruise after another, uh, we had our ROV. And as I mentioned, we're, we're mapping half the day and then we're diving with the ROV the other half of the day. And, and everything that we do, uh, ex uh, but not all the, the bathymetry work, but all the ROV work, uh, we stream that live uh, to our YouTube channel and. You can go back there and you can watch hundreds of hours worth of dives or you can see the snippets and, and the highlight reels. Uh, but it was uh, it was an amazing opportunity to work in Australia. And unfortunately, but fortunately for COVID, it kept us in Australia uh, about uh, three quarters of a year longer than we anticipated. But working with Geoscience Australia, working with um, uh, University of, of Sydney and uh, Australian Marine Parks and University of Queensland and James Cook University, we were able to put together a variety of programs that uh, were heavily, heavily focused on uh, seafloor mapping uh, in East Australia. So we spent, uh, you know, again, this uh, past 450 days in Australia mapping all four coasts, including the Great Barrier Reef. We extensively uh, mapped Great Barrier Reef, and we found one of these 500-meter uh, uh, tall detached reefs, one of the first that's been found in 120 years. That was in the very northern part of the GBR, and extensively in the Australian marine parks, including Coral Sea Marine Parks. And then a little bit further to the north, um, uh, between uh, Kiribati and, and Hawaii, the Baker and Howland Islands, uh, we spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, mapping uh, in that region around seamounts and new uh, coral systems, part of the U.S. National Wildlife Refuge. And as I was just mentioning, most recently, the Phoenix Islands Protected Area in UNESCO, the World Heritage Site. Unfortunately, uh, we were uh, planning to be in uh, Kiribati and uh, uh, due to COVID, uh, we weren't able to secure those permits, but we tried. I mean, we've been working on the, uh, on the marine uh, research authorization permits for uh for about eight months and then uh we kept trying to even when we were at the edge of uh of their coastal waters uh, we tried really really hard to uh to get the permits but unfortunately uh, because of covid it, it just wasn't possible um but what uh what kevin was talking about this picking in the new year so really exciting this is i think what uh was um, um uh, 
uh, something that, that carried us right, <laughs> literally carried us from the end of 2020 into 2021 was this idea that um, uh, because we were still in Australia and working and uh, in some of the work that we were, were doing, how to get repurposed, we said uh, to some of our collaborators in Australia and to the, the CBIT 2030 project, what if we do um, a couple of exclusive cruises where it's all about uh, the CBED 2030 data collection. So we teamed up with, uh, um, again, with James Cook University and the University of Queensland, and of course, uh, Kevin and others and Jamie in the UK. And uh, we had to uh, thank you for delivering this the, the first uh, CBED 2030 flag to us. We, as you can see in the image here, we, uh, we had it uh, proudly on board our ship as, as we were uh, leaving uh, Brisbane and, uh, and then spent uh, literally the next uh, 60 days divided into two different cruises, mapping from the end of 2020 and then uh, right into, into 2021. So it was really thrilling. And um, we collected some great data in, in, uh, in the, the Tasman Sea and, and the Coral Sea. And, uh, and thanks to um, um, our seabed program and Kim Picard, which I'm not sure if she's still on, uh, did a, a an amazing job of quickly taking the data that we were, the bathymetry data, and then putting it into their portal and making that publicly available as, as soon as possible. Uh, but these two cruises that we did, uh, these back-to-back, -back, uh, the mapping the Tasman and Coral Seas, and then the subsequent one, uh, the Sea Florida Seabirds and the Coral Sea, just the names that we gave them, but they were put together very, very quickly, and, uh, and, and hopefully it, it brought some awareness and recognition to the CBA 2030 program. Uh, but they were truly dedicated uh, to, to supporting uh, the, the initiative. The ancillary benefit, of course, is that we we're able to take on some others, so, uh, some other people who uh, did some microplastic studies. Um, we did some uh, bird watching, uh, bird counting uh, with, uh, with a program that comes out of uh, Tasmania. And we uh, did some extensive uh, magnetometer towing um, uh, along the way, and many, many thanks go to the Australian Marine Parks for their great support in helping us uh, uh, migrate and, and work through that. So how much data did we collect? So 80,000 square kilometers of seafloor, twice the land area of Switzerland, at around 39,000 uh, square meters of, of land mass, and spent 59 days at sea for those two legs for this dedicated to CBIT 2030 cruises and aboard we had scientists and the students, we had artists, um, and we had this real-time uh, remote support, which uh, several of you on the call are familiar with, with being able to, we have high bandwidth on board the ship, so we had many, uh, several scientists who were all over the world, of course, several in Australia, who were able to participate in the cruises and, and provide some guidance on where um, some of the best places um, to collect the data. Just two snapshots of, of these areas that uh, that uh, we did this data collection and this is from our website and you can go and click on the little icons and bring up uh, some pop up information about uh, these areas specifically. There's little blogs that go along with each one of these icons um, so you can get a little bit more detail, but we have these. This is again just up to 60 days, but we have this spread throughout all of the um, of Eastern Australia, North Australia, and then of course, Northwest and the Western and the Southern part of, of uh, Australian waters as well. And in addition to the, what we just did up in um, the Phoenix Island protected area. I can't uh, not recognize all the collaborators that helped us. We had nine collaborating organizations for the first leg, 13 for uh, the second leg, but as I mentioned, there's uh, uh, aside from the Australian government, the James Cook, University, um, uh, University of Queensland, uh, the, the expedition crew members. This is a, a woman initiative to get the women scientists at sea. So uh, great support from uh, from all around uh, Oceania. So uh, we put together just a couple of minute video that I wanted to share with you that uh, was all about the, the JEPCO project and us bringing into the new year um, some of the data. So. This is the first ocean mapping data collected of the new year and of the UN Decade of Ocean Science.
The goal of the Nippon Foundation JEPCO Seabed 2030 project is to map the world's ocean seafloor by the year 2030. We are currently mapping in the northern Tasman Sea off the east coast of Australia. The maps we create are vital to further the understanding of the shape of our planet. Currently, only 20% of the world's oceans are mapped. So there are vast areas of the ocean where we know very little about. In some places we are mapping, the seabed rises suddenly. These are the remains of extinct volcanoes, millions of years old. A camera down here might show cold water corals and sponges existing in the dark attached to the solid rock. We know that these mountains of the sea, or sea mounts, are important places for biodiversity in the deep ocean, providing vital habitats for marine life. The detailed seafloor maps of this expedition will help us to understand the geological history and formation of the Australian continent. For example, Australia broke away from the supercontinent Gondwana millions of years ago. The remains of that breakup are the areas we are mapping in this expedition. The first ping of data on the new year. 25 seconds. So with this expedition on the RV Falcor, we are proud to be part of the global effort for the CBIT 2030 project and the start of the UN Decade of Ocean Science. All right, so thanks for that. That was a lot of fun, and we appreciate, of course, CBED 2030 and the uh, the assistance they provided in in those two expeditions. So, uh, under the, the 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 topic of the sources of the uh, bathymetric data, um, we are going to uh, replace our vessel, um, the existing one that we have now called Falcor. Uh, we're going to uh, replace that in uh, next year, and it's. Um, a, a sign from um, our organization, it's a commitment to continue the advancing our understanding and the protection of the world's oceans really for decades to come. So Eric and Wendy Schmidt uh, wanted to be able to provide something a little bit bigger and better with more capabilities to um, uh, scientists from all over the globe. And uh, the ship right now uh, that we purchased, it's, it's in Spain, we're refitting it. We're going to have, of course, uh, the entire suite of echo sounders, multi-beam echo sounders um, from the shallowest water to the full ocean depth. And uh, uh, we'll uh, have the largest arrays that you can possibly uh, source to be able to put on a, a ship of this size and a gondola that's going to be about uh, uh, 20 plus meters in length. So um, quite a commitment and we're looking forward to using that and collecting data uh, throughout the Pacific and other lo locations as well. Um, Related to data management and sharing, again, I can't say enough about the uh, OSS Seabed, uh, the support um, that we received from them. There was some special recognition for the programs that we were doing. It was called out in a very recent newsletter of theirs. Um, they were also able to ingest it and process and publish around 200,000 uh, square kilometers of, of the C4 data that we collected um, just over the, the literally the past year, um, and that's now on their, their portal. And then also a, a big thank you to um, uh, to the C, to the Aussie Bed program for the UN World's Oceans Day uh, celebration, where they um, uh, they hosted a viewing of our mapping efforts to highlight about how these sea mounts and canyons affected biodiversity of the seabed. So there's an educational component behind it. And then uh, what's next for us uh, is doing some some C4 mapping and some other discovery work uh, using the, our ship and our robotic ROV system off the uh, west coast of the United States and, in, and off the west coast of Mexico. And for 2022 with our, our new ship, um, yet to be determined where we're going to be bringing it. We're working on that now. Um, uh, we'll see. Uh, it will find its way to the Pacific at some point. But one of the things that we learned, um, this is my, my final comment, as we were uh, doing this extensive mapping around these uh, shelf edges and slopes adjacent to shelf barrier reefs, um, it, it took about four times longer to map these areas than we originally anticipated. 
Um, I mean, you have to really, really uh, drive a ship uh, very, very carefully along some of these areas, especially in these reef areas. And fortunately, on our ship, we have uh, a deployable 360 degree omnidirectional sonar um, that allowed us to get a right hug close to uh, these reef systems. But uh, because of that, we're going a, a, a much slower. So the takeaway is, again, when you're planning these shallow water uh, mapping cruises with a ship like this, um, although it has a lot of capabilities, um, it is extremely time uh, intensive. Um, of course, we all know that the deeper water, the, the water is swath width, but uh, certainly something we'll be thinking about for the next time we're, we're doing some of this type of a work. But again, appreciate uh, all the efforts from those that are on this call and, um, and looking forward to the continued efforts and working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. That's very good. Really interesting talk. Uh, and it's great to see the Falcor. I must, from, the, from everyone here and from CBED 2030, I think we can all thank the Schmidt Ocean Institute and uh, the team there for doing all this work because it's a, a tremendous contribution to um, seafloor mapping that you've done. Um, there are a couple of questions there. Uh, the first one is from Kevin. Kevin, would you like to go first? Yeah, <laughs> so Eric, great talk. Um, just I don't even realise that that video sound didn't come through. Um, oh. So we've now we just put on the chat that we'll, we, because this is being recorded, we'll we'll put that video in the recording for everybody. But do you have a hyperlink for that that we can put on the chat for people that are linked to? I perhaps? do. Boy, that uh, yeah, that is that's, that's really unfortunate because uh, it was great, great stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll grab so that. that. Grab that if now. If you just put that in the chat for everyone to do. But my, my actual question was um, that that relationship you had between the mapping and Oz Seabed was outstanding. And and for us at Seabed 2030, you know, we were able to really quickly get those data products and 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 we had a deadline to meet in order to get data into the GeoCode 2021 grid. And that rapid flow through Oz Seabed meant that we could get all your latest data straight into the grid. For ongoing systems, we off Kiribati and other places, how is the best place for us to access your data? Are you uh, uh, for us, for Schmidt Ocean Institute? The data that we're collecting. Well, all the all the bathymetry data that that we provided, uh, that we've collected since uh, we began operating, has uh, uh, been submitted. Uh, ultimately, it's found its way to, to the CBED 2030 program at JECO. So you should have it all. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, my understanding is it all goes to the rolling debt to repository stuff anyway, right? It, it does. It does. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we we're not submitting it directly. Uh, most of it's going through that rolling debt to repository in the U.S. But it, but uh, Australia was a bit different. It was we bypass it. We were <laughs> directly right. Yeah, there. And, and, and in terms of the timeliness, that 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 bypass was fantastic, right? It, so. Yeah, it was a great collaboration, and, and again, it helped from Geoscience Australia and and others from um, uh, James Cook University, uh, certainly helping with that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any? Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, hi, Eric. Um, uh, just now you introduced that you use uh, you uh, or uh, ROV to uh, do the uh, measurement. I was wondering what kind of the device was carried in that uh, ROV. Is that uh, both being multi being or single being uh, sonar, or uh, is that uh, the uh, omnidirection sonar that you mentioned? Yeah, with with the uh, so all the mapping was done uh, primarily with the ship. Um, the omnidirectional sonar that was only for um, obstacle avoidance only for obstacle avoidance, so that we could um, maneuver the ship very close to the reefs. So the sonar is looking off to the side of the ship, to kind of the side into uh, the forward quarter, while the ship is progressing forward. So um, it allowed us to. Um, you know, stand off, um, you know, essentially an, an equal distance off of the ship and, and to make sure that there were no such reefs that were uh, too shallow in, in front of us because the majority of the, the water is all uncharted. Okay, got it. And my another question is, is it make 
the differences to uh, uh, survey different the water with different depths. Uh, I mean, uh, does it mean the deeper, the lower resolution uh, or the harder to get a better resol resolution? I was just curious about the measurement. Yeah, I mean, the, the resolution, I mean, we're we're collecting a, a better resolution than what's minimally required or minimally requested. You know, we, as uh, Kevin had pointed out and um, and, and Jamie's from the um, yeah, from the the 800 by 800 down to or or is uh, fine. It's 100 by 100. But what's the challenge is um, it's because of the steepness of the of the slopes. Um, I mean, it's it's um, um, the, it's the topography. You know, as you know, when you're trying to go around seamount, it's the same thing. I mean, uh, uh, trying to map really really steep seamounts is the same as um, some of the some of the steep uh, sharp edges of of the coral reefs, and it's trying it's trying to make sure that it's clean data, right? If you go too fast and you get a lot of you get a lot of spotty data that you have to go back and clean up later. A lot of artifacts in the data. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, Meredith, you have a question. Go ahead, Meredith. Hi, um, wonderful talk, Eric. Thank you for that. Um, I was particularly struck by what you were saying about how much time it takes to navigate the shallower tricky bits with such a large vessel. And it looks like your new vessel, you're actually sizing up. Um, would you consider doing like the the um, the NOAA model of things where the larger vessel supports a smaller, I mean, launch? Uh, type vessel with a higher frequency sonar uh, so that you can get in and out of those tricky bits in, in a safer and more timely fashion. Thank you. Yeah, great, great question. So uh, the first is uh, it is bigger and it's it's uh, deeper, but it's far, far more maneuverable. Um, it's, uh, it's highly maneuverable. This ship that we're bringing in has three bow thrusters. It has voice Schneider uh, 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 stern thrusters, so it's precision uh, maneuverability. We're putting an omnidirectional sonar to, um, as well in this one. But as you point out, um, uh, this vessel also has uh, about a thousand square meters of open deck space um, where we can put a whole uh, flotilla of uh, autonomous or, or other types of ve uh, mapping vessels on the back there. Um, mm -hmm to do just what you're asking for. So sure, it's absolutely possible and we're already looking at, at doing that. We don't have any particular project in mind, but it, it opens up an enormous amount of possibilities. I mean, you can put uh, sea kits and sail drones and um, Ike's Blue, you, also, you, you name it, you could fill the back deck with all sorts of uh, amazing mapping systems. Um, so as a ship might be doing a, a diving, ROV diving in one area, this flotilla of, of vehicles could be uh, mapping the surrounding the surrounding seafloor for sure. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, are there any more questions for Eric or for any of the other speakers for that matter? In which case, I think I will close the session. And thank all the speakers again for their um, participation and their really interesting talks. We've had a good range of, of talks from deep water to shallow water and all in the uh, area of interest. Um, I might hand back to Kevin. Uh, do you want to say anything more before we close and then um, get prepared for tomorrow? Yeah, thanks, Vaughan. So, um, no, I don't need, have, need to add anything. Um, just to say thank you very much for your attention. Um, and and please um, join us tomorrow morning uh, at the same time again for day two of the session. Uh, so thank you very much again, and I'd like to say goodbye. Yes, OK, thank you. Goodbye.